just on. Hey, oh, we were? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Shout out to Good Dog and the lovely Laura Morgan. And it's early in the morning, and we're, where are we? San Jose. But where are we, really? In the airplane. We're on an airplane, right? Take a look around, everybody. Like, really see, like, here we are on an airplane. I'm going to answer some questions for you guys. Um, get these all done. Uh, uh, I apologize for the scruff and the sleepy demeanor. Um, I think this might be too long. Hey everybody, shout out to Good Dog and the lovely Laura Morgan over here who's going as the, the Dark Emperor from Star Wars. Bring that up to your mouth. Well, look, I want it right here between I'll, the two of us. I'll, I'll take it back when you want. We'll, we'll see, like, let's, let's check out and see what this, what this sounds like. This is just a, a sound check. <laughs> Everybody, Sean the Good Dog, and we are uh, actually en route. We're on uh, on a flight from San Jose to uh, Los Angeles. We've been gone for three weeks uh, in New Orleans, working with dogs, and then in Santa Cruz for a week doing Train the Trainers launch. And we are tired, but we are here for you. And we're about to do Q and A Saturday from the plane. How cool is that? Unless I fall asleep, then it's not that cool. Laura, say hi. Hello. <laughs> So uh, we're using this little microphone thing. It's a little um, jerry rigged here, but we're hoping we're, we're hoping we're getting some good stuff. So um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, let's check out our first question. All right. Okay. It's gonna be a quick one because we don't have a ton of space. On yeah, we don't have a ton of space. We got to move kind of quick. Okay. So. Um, so Karen Howard Luna asks, uh, loved your video, f or she actually says, loved your video from Nola. Um, do you ever take on rescue dogs? The rescue I work, the rescue I work with, has a dog that needs some serious intervention. Um, Karen, we do do rescue work, but it's it's pretty limited because we are we're a really small operation. So um, we have the Good Dog Ambassador Program, and that those are dogs that we hand pick. Um, through certain rescues and certain rescue people that we work with so it's very very limited we do do rescue stuff but it's only with the good dog ambassador program and they're only specific dogs um, specific uh, uh, behaviors and things like that we're looking for very specific kind of dogs so we don't do general um, uh, gen rescue. general rescue stuff but so in New Orleans we could do something like a rescue remedy like we've um, we've set up something before called a rescue remedy where basically we do like a one day three hour thing for any rescuers who want to come and learn foundation which is what we teach dogs in one-on-one -on -one training sessions and board and train and all that if you were down for that and you could get a couple other people we'd make it super super low cost and the next time we're in NOLA we'll do three to four hours of just low cost teach you the basics foundation stuff if you're a rescue so yeah so that's pretty cool so so uh, we've got our very limited good dog ambassador program which is one dog at a time and until that dog is is homed and and sent out we don't take on another dog and we actually currently have a dog hannah that we're looking for a home for but like laura's mentioning we do also have um uh rescue remedy which is a program where we work with rescues to give them the tools and the information so they can do better work with the, the shelter and rescue dogs that they get uh, get coming in and have a better chance at, at getting them good homes. So uh, that's Karen. Our next question is from it's Steve. Gonna be a quick one. It's a quick one, guys. We're on the plane, man. We only got so much time and so much memory on this baby. So um, this one's from Steve R. Steve R says, can you go over your crittering protocol? And that's a timely question because we were just at T3 launch and I was doing a bunch of crittering with a really, really reactive, um, really dog aggressive uh, French bulldog. And so basically the way I do crittering, there's a bunch of different stuff. I mean, you can go to lucastle.com, L-O-U-C-A-S-T-L-E.com. And Lou um, has very uh, complex crittering protocols all written out and described and you can follow those if you want. I do a bit of a looser, more simple form of crittering. And uh, do it with e-collar, and usually, usually e-collar and prong collar, uh, and leash. And um, I'll start to walk the dog towards the target, the trigger, whatever it is. And when I see that the dog starts to escalate at the very, very beginning, then I will uh, apply continuous pressure with the e-collar at a level that's enough for the dog to start to be motivated by to try and turn off, but not so much that the dog is upset or freaked out or vocalizing or something like that. Simultaneously, while I'm holding that button, I'll then give, I'll start to back, back 
away from whatever the trigger or target is, giving very light leash pressure information to the dog, saying this is how you turn the e-collar pressure off, right? So, uh-oh, it's the captain. Hopefully we can compete. Um, so, so as I'm walk, so with the Frenchie, as I'm walking towards another dog at a distance, the Frenchie starts to alert. I see the ears become very uh, upright, and he becomes very tense. And I see, okay, we're, he's starting to go into a negative space. I apply uh, e-collar pressure, and that pressure is really going to be dependent on the dog um, and the e-collar you're using. I press continuous, and I start rolling up on the dial, looking for a response from the dog that the dog actually notices the e-collar pressure. And at the point where he starts to look around, like I'm looking for something to do with this e-collar pressure, then I use the uh, the leash to guide him backwards and say, this is what you do with that pressure, back away from the thing you're uncomfortable with. And I do repetitions over and over and over again. And what happens is you end up being able to move closer and closer and closer to the target to where eventually you're right next to the dog or whatever it was that the dog was originally upset, freaked out by. And the dog is typically, if you've done, if you've done it right, is not stressed and not reactive. But rolling around on the dial and getting really savvy with, with the e-collar and how to find that level that's motivating but not upsetting to the dog and then keeping everything relaxed and calm and neutral and reading both that dog and the other trigger, that's where things get a little bit more nuanced but that's basically crittering crittering is it started out you know for critters and um so you can check out lucastle.com and get the full complex version my version is e-collar leash and prong uh set up the trigger and then when the dog becomes uncomfortable add light e-collar pressure find the level the dog's motivator to try and turn it off by and then start to back the dog away with very gentle leash guidance you want the dog to do 90 percent of the work on its own the leash is just there to hint or whisper where i where i want the dog to go so that's uh steve r and Laura Morgan, I'm sorry I'm taking your job today. I'm reading the questions. I'm, I'm not even letting you do your thing. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, Dana Reinhardt says, My dog has a very reliable recall, both with and without his e-collar. However, if I recall him from a distance of more than about 10 feet, he breaks into a full sprint and... Uh, no, and often blows right past people. No, because there's nobody really close to us. Um, uh... If I recall him from a distance of more than about 10 feet, he breaks into a full sprint and often blows right past me if I can't sidestep fast enough to intercept him. He'll then take a few seconds to de-escalate, uh, de, de accelerate and amble back to me. How can I slow him down on his recall? I've been hesitant to start messing with the e-collar corrections because I don't want to confuse him by correcting for making the choice to come whenever I call. Um, this is a, we actually just had this question at T3 launch. Somebody was asking Jeff about that. And um, basically what you have to do is you have to start cultivating that the recall doesn't mean just fly to me. The recall means fly to me, but then you got to sit in front of me. So a great way to start doing that is start at, sh at, at smaller distances where your dog is, his energy is more manageable and maybe have him you know if he's disinterested or wanders away then recall him back or you can put him in a sit but like say say you do like a five foot recall or a ten foot recall and recall him to you and then make sure he doesn't have enough head of his speed just quite yet and then ask him to sit you can use e-collar pressure to enforce that sit and get him to actually pay attention and de 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 accelerate or de-escalate and you can also use your body to move in front of him to block and start to cultivate that beginning of you've got to come to me and stop and sit now eventually you're not going to want to have to move in front of him to do that you're going to want your dog to do that and move towards you um, but initially there's there's a bunch of different ways that we can do that but the concept is basically if you think about it start small incrementally like all dog training start small with the dog not being at full speed and get the dog to come and give the sit command as he's coming towards you within like you know uh, it's hard depends on how fast your dog's moving but like a foot or two away from you sit give the dog a second and then get on the on the e-collar pressure you might want to be on the continuous button at a level that your dog's not worried about but your dog is motivated by to try and turn off and then do the sit and then you can get farther and farther away as your dog gets more comfortable when he realizes that the, the strategy of the game or the rules of the game are not just to run to me and run by, but you actually have to run to me and sit. So start small, start easy, start at a slow speed, uh, demand the sit at those short distances and slow speed, and then you can build up to bigger stuff where he's really like at a big distance and flies to you and he knows no matter how fast I go, I gotta come into the sit. But use the e-collar to make sure that you're cultivating that sit if he's too excited, hey, we're taking off. 
if he's too excited and uh, is, is struggling with, with um, prioritizing the sit over the excitement of just running to you. All right, so that is uh, Dana. We're taking off. You guys see that? We're leaving San Jose. All right. Um, Okay, so we're okay, though. I used to be really scared of flying, but uh, when I was touring with the band, we flew so much that it beat it out of me to the point where I had no more anxiety left. And uh, so now I don't mind. I, I was flooding, just like dog stuff. Now I, all my anxiety has trickled out, and uh, so I don't have much left. Um, anyways, okay, so here's Patty Zorn Havens. Uh, she does uh, short term fostering for shel shelter animals until they leave for rescue. Um, one tendency she's noticed is that um, many of them have a tendency to nip your clothes, not aggressively, just out of excitement or playfulness. It still hurts though, and it's not the best trait when looking for a forever home. I've read to say no in a calm voice over and over with bad behavior, not to get loud. This is hard to do when a dog is nipping you and it hurts, lol. I've also been told to yell like it hurt so they will know it does and, sen and since they don't want to hurt you, they will quit. With, uh, with an e-collar not an option, how best can I change this behavior? So um, I would really want, as somebody who's setting up dogs to be ready to be adopted out or go to... Uh, you know, go from foster to rescue or whatever your program is, um, any kind of nipping clothes or hands or anything is going to be a super unwanted behavior. And it's going to really stand in the way of that dog having a, a good chance of being adopted, especially if there's kids involved. So um, it's such an easy one to fix. Um, it's a great question because it happens for so it happens to so many people. But what I would do is I would seeing as e collars aren't aren't um, uh, an option. Just get a um, just get a prong collar. And make sure the prong collar is sized. You, if you're doing a bunch of different size dogs, get a small, which is a 2.25 Herm Springer, <clears throat> and get a 3.0, which is a medium Herm Springer. Have have one of each size um, at your place. That way you're ready for just about any size dog. And then um, size the size the prong collar for whatever dog you're working with. Um, say you're working with like a medium to small dog, use the small Herm Springer, and you can watch my prong collar video and see how the sizing is supposed to be. And then you let the dog drag a leash connected to the to the prong collar around. And as soon as the dog goes for any of its nipping behavior, and if you know how to set it up, if you know what triggers it, like maybe excited talk or quick movement or something with your hands around his face, if you know that that causes the nipping behavior, then just as soon as it happens, just calmly say no, pick up the leash calmly, there's no big rush, and give the dog a pop on the prong collar, which is a quick jerk and release on the prong to correspond with the behavior of nipping your hand or clothes. Basically, you want to make nipping your hand or clothes or any body part an uncomfortable endeavor. So if you do, if you use the prong and the leash right and you find a level on the on that correction-wise is valuable enough to the dog, the nipping will go away very, very, very quickly. This does not have to be something that you work on for weeks. This is something within the first day or two. If, if you're effective with the tool, the dog will stop nipping almost instantaneously. And then just let him drag the leash and prong around, you know, whenever you're home supervising so he doesn't get in trouble. But whenever you're home supervising, let him have the leash and prong on. And, uh, and that way, if he gets inspired again to, to, uh, to nip or somebody else in the house maybe goes after, you know, to nip or, you know, gets too exuberant, I mean, it's so easy then to interact and give the dog a good, clear communication about what's allowed and what's not allowed. So, um, and, and it's not just for nipping, it's for, for anything. If you're trying to cultivate sits or, or boundaries in the house about you're not allowed in this room or that, having a leash and a corrective collar or a training, t training collar on is an awesome way to to really help dogs learn at a much more accelerated pace and then keep you from having to raise your voice, get frustrated, and then you can send that dog home with much better manners and much better skills and a much better chance of getting adopted as well. So that's Patty. And we're moving on. Um, let's see. So Artem um, said, uh, my question today is about duration work. If foundation is great for beginning of balanced dog training, one of the powerful ways uh, which allows us to remove uh, most behavior problems. Um, and it, sorry, the, the question's kind of long and it's a little bit broken up. Uh, so then 
duration work, I guess, is a huge part of that and one of the main things about fan foundation. So I think Artem's trying to figure out how that, that duration work is important to, to balance dog training and foundation. So he says, so can you tell us about duration work more? How many times do you usually need to spend to build up non-negotiable place, down, sit, and heal over two-week board and train? Um, so duration works huge. It's a big part of state of mind training. It's a big part of what we do, and it's a big, big reason why we're so successful with so many dogs. So we basically we work our sessions differently than a lot of other trainers, and we'll usually have a dog out for an hour and a half to two hours, and we'll incorporate duration work into that program. So once a dog knows, you know, we typically don't do duration sit because dogs it's uncomfortable for dogs for, to sit for a long time. But for down or place, absolutely. So I would be focused on those as your two main duration work um, exercises. Once you've taught a dog on leash and prong or any tool, what down is and what place is, then you can start working on duration, which basically is just time. And you you want you want to start off slowly, incrementally. You don't want to have the dog. You don't want to have the dog bite off more than he can chew too quickly, right? So, sorry, we got a competing interest here. Um, the joys of Q&A on, on a plane. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk over her. But, um, so don't start too with too much distraction or too much distance. Um, if you leave the room when you're trying to do duration work with a dog in place and he's just started, there's a good chance he's going to break. So start with small distances. Get the duration work with you still in the room, you at 5 feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, you on the couch, something like that, where you can correct and communicate and get the dog back in, back into place or down if he makes a mistake. So, and then build up the, the amount of time that you're going to do that. Typically, if you're, if you're good with, with your leash and prong and, and you've taught the dog effectively what the behavior means, if you've taught the dog effectively what the behavior means, then duration work is pretty easy because then you just give little reminders, right? So say you've got a dog in place and he knows place and you've taught him very fairly and now you go and you sit on the couch and he's in place in the, in the middle of the living room. Five minutes goes by and he's awesome. And then he decides, I'm going to go see if I can get out of here. And he tries to get up and walk across the room and go somewhere else. So as soon as you see that, you say no calmly. Then you calmly walk over, grab the leash, give the leash a small pop, which is going to be a consequence for breaking the command, and then you guide the dog back to place. So three-step program. So no to market, physical consequence with the pop of the leash, and then guide the dog back to place. And then your, your goal is really just to make sure that you slowly up the challenge, slowly up the distance, slowly up the duration, and make sure that, make sure that your, your corrections <clears throat> Are valuable enough for your dog to prioritize what you're asking so if you undercorrect and the dog really wants to go check out another thing or run out the door then you're gonna struggle and he, you have competing interests and his interest is going to win now that said that doesn't mean that you just correct a dog so severely that he never breaks place again of course we're talking about using common sense and making sure that we're looking for fair training and fair consequences for a fair amount of increased in incremental distraction and duration and, and challenge. So your job is to read the dog and start to push, but don't push so hard that the dog isn't able to succeed. So we want to keep pushing boundaries, keep getting those muscles stronger with the dogs, but making sure that they're reasonable requests. And remember, if a dog that's been doing place work or down for a considerable amount of time continues to break, and you keep correcting but he continues to break, chances are very, very, very good that you're under correcting and you're not inspiring him with your correction. And so he's just choosing his priority, which is I'm going to go somewhere else because it's more fun or I want to go check this out because it smells good or whatever it is. So duration work is a huge, huge, huge part of the process. Um, like I was starting to say at the beginning of this, we do about an hour and a half to two hours of a session for each dog in our board and train. But only a few minutes of that, maybe 10, 15, will be active work. I'm doing this. I want you to learn sit. I need you to learn down. I need you to work on recall to this. And then I'll have the dog stay in place for 15, 20 minutes. And then I'll get the dog back up again. And maybe I'll work him for five minutes and work on whatever, you know, once again, I'm working on sit or working on down or working on recall. And then I'll put him in place somewhere else. Maybe he's in the bathroom now. And now he's in the bathroom for 25 minutes. 
So that's how our two hour or one and a half hour sessions go. A smattering of active work and then a lot of duration work. A lot of trainers put dogs away back in, in the crate so the dogs can have soak time, but I prefer to have their soak time be also duration work time. So I'm getting a lot more bang, I feel, for my buck. And the dogs are, are learning while they're, while they're retaining and processing information that they just learned they're also getting a lot of duration muscle building exercises and learning how to just tolerate stuff going on in the environment so hopefully Artem hopefully that answers your question okay um, let's see uh, Sarah says uh, Sean Laura one of my regular clients is a one-year-old boulder border collie poodle cross that growls fearful around men especially my husband who's 260 pounds, six foot tall of intimidation. Uh, wow. Um, and the dog submissively pees everywhere every time he sees him. Um, I've tried e-collar corrections, intense exercise, positive re reinforcement, and trust exercises with toy. The dog's not food motivated. The growling is not going away. No, the growling is going away, but the peeing is not. Thoughts or suggestions? So it's a challenging one. Um, what I would do, Sarah, especially having your husband being such a big guy is I would work on food drive with your dog to so even though your dog's not food motivated all dogs are food motivated if they have enough motivation to eat so what I would say is that this dog only eats by coming to your husband to eat out of his hand so but that doesn't mean your husband talks says a lot does a lot just a calm you know you know here boy um, some kissy noises let the dog knows where know where he's at and then holds out his hand with food and allows the dog the option to eat eventually the dog will choose to eat from your husband's hand um, you could also if if you're really struggling with that you could have your husband roll some some kibble out on the ground in front of him so the distance is excuse me a little bit greater and maybe a little bit more um, feasible for the dog but eventually what I'd be trying to do is create enough leverage and motivation through a food drive that the dog will, even though he's stressed out about your husband, um, will decide to come towards your husband or you, whoever you're trying to work for, work with, and have him do the work on his own so you don't get the submissive peeing. The submissive peeing comes from feeling too much pressure. But if the pressure is emanating more from the dog internally saying, I want to go get that food, then you're likely not to get the submissive peeing, the growling, or any of that stuff. And you start to create really positive associations that are powerful in a much different way than if you're just trying to say, here's a treat or here's food but your dog's already eaten or your dog just ate last night you probably won't have enough motivation for the dog to try and overcome his anxiety so I'm hoping that makes sense which is basically we build food drive by saying here's what I need you to do and the only way you get your food is by doing this activity and so you may find that the dog is reluctant for a couple of days to do that but eventually the dog will say I'm hungry enough to actually go towards your husband and start to take the food and like I said if you want to baby step it and have him roll the food out like a foot or so in front of him and kind of use that as a bridge and then slowly draw the dog towards him you could do that as well but I would not have your not have your um, your husband doing a lot of in verbal encouragement it would be a quiet kneeling down sideways to the dog no eye contact hand out with the food be very neutral very still and let the dog make his decision and if the dog does decide to eat out of his hand do not make a party out of it just keep it all quiet neutral all of that stuff's too much pressure for this dog so you want to make your husband like this neutral non-pressure filled guy who just so happens to be where food comes from and but that can be a waiting game and you have to really make sure that the dog will get to the point where they're hungry enough to uh, override that that discomfort of anxiety to go after the food so hopefully that makes sense um, Karen Thompson says uh, with e-collar training do you use uh, momentary continuous or momentary and continuous as a standard setting also when trained with the e-collar low-level conditioning do you use uh, continuous hold while working on commands they should know like sit down and then boost tap after you're satisfied with the progress uh, as a reminder um, basically um, if I'm using say say I'm using what I typically use which is um, e-collar technologies um, uh, what is it, Laura? It's the uh, Educator Mini 300, and you can set it up a variety of ways. The way I set it up is with the black button being momentary and the red button being continuous. So it'll, say on the, it'll say on the readout, it'll say MC, right. so not just M or 
not just see right so when you set it up right there's a button on the back of of the of that of that remote that says m slash c and you push that button uh until you see m and c on the on the lcd readout and that means that now your buttons are set up accordingly where it's black is momentary red is continuous and there's no boost because i don't use boost and i don't recommend my clients do either so okay so do you use uh all right so so that's how i have the collar set up and then for 99.99 percent of all my training i use the continuous button so say i'm teaching a dog to sit I've already taught the dog to sit with the leash and prong over and over again with light pressure with the leash and prong, guidance with the prong and my hand while saying sit, and then removing the pressure in the leash and prong along with the marker good when the dog finishes the sit. I've done that bunches of times to where I know the dog knows that. Then I can add e-collar, which is usually a couple days down the line. So we found the dog's working level or motivation level, and I'm using the continuous button. Say the dog is motivated at a level eight, leash and prong on, I will say sit, I will simultaneously press the continuous button and hold it, and if the dog doesn't immediately move towards a sit, I continue to hold the button, and then I will use a little bit of light pressure guidance up with the leash and prong, and two fingers while holding the remote on the dog's rear to put him in the down. As soon as his butt hits the ground, get off the button and say good, and repeat this process. Now the only challenge can be if your dog is, is if you're struggling finding your motivational level with your dog um, on continuous, um, then it takes a little bit of nuanced dexterity. Say eight, he feels, but he's like, I'm not really motivated by that. Then holding the button and repeating the command, I'll probably start to dial up slowly from eight to nine to 10 to 11. And then if I feel like the dog is still struggling, I'm gonna once again help with guidance from the leash and then fingers pushing down. Basically, you're looking for the dog to do 90% of the work itself just through pressure and the command, but of course he's been patterned with the leash and prong prior to this, and then you're using the e-collar and, and patterning, layering it over. And then the point from there is making sure the dog is motivated. But also remember that just because the dog knows sit either with food or sit with leash and prong, once you put the e-collar on, dogs can be distracted by by the e-collar pressure because it's something new and different. So don't be upset with your dog or frustrated if he doesn't sit right away. It's not necessarily that your dog knows it and doesn't want to offer the behavior. Your dog might be nervous, might be unnerved, might be freaked out, might be concerned, might just be distracted by the e-collar pressure and not know what to do, which is why you always want to help. So when you sense confusion, make sure you help. When you sense knuckleheadedry or your dog being a brat, then that's when you tend to want to go for corrections. So sit, press the button and hold. If the butt doesn't go towards the ground, then you might dial up a teeny bit while holding continuous and then start to guide the dog with leash pressure up and finger pressure down. Now, your, the rest of your question about what do you do as far as going to uh, correction phase, I think is what you're asking about. So, so what we'll do is um, once the dog knows sit really well and I pattern a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, I press the button at eight, I say sit, the dog's butt goes to the ground, button comes off, I say good, wow, dog really knows this behavior really well, we're rocking and rolling. Then what I'll do is I'll dial up to maybe say 12, you could you could say like double is kind of like a, a jumping off point but I usually start a little lower so if eight was kind of his motivational level I might try 12 and then I'll say sit with no pressure from the leash and no pressure from the e-collar and if he doesn't start to move towards the group doesn't move his butt towards the ground then I will say the command again and pop with a quick tap on continuous and if his butt doesn't hit the ground then I will help him get to that to that uh, in that position because once again now we're talking about quicker more sudden pressure and that could be distracting even though your dog knows sit with continuous holding maybe now when you say sit and you tap continuous at 12 he goes whoa I'm not sure what that means so or he's not feeling the continuous pressure and so he needs a little more help so that's how I go to the corrective process whether it's sit down uh, place or recall make sure the dog is really really comfortably patterned and then I'm going to go to a slightly higher level and in a, in a very moderate distraction, distraction level start asking for that behavior and correct if I don't get it. But I'm also going to help if the dog seems like he's stuck or struggling and not able to do it. I don't want to just go higher, higher, higher and demand compliance. I want to look for is the dog needing help or is the dog not wanting to do it. There's a big thing with attitude here. If you've got a dog that's my hand is falling asleep and I think Laura's falling asleep too. 
Um, there's a big difference between a dog that's confused and a dog that doesn't want to offer the behavior. And that's where dog training expertise comes in. So that's your job is to try and figure out what your dog's offering. Is he know it or does he not know it? Um, is he confused? Does he need help? Or is he blowing you off? Um, I'm good, thanks. Okay guys, so we're back. We had a quick break for uh, snacky time. Uh, Delta's got the best cookies going. If you, excuse me, if you haven't tried Delta's, um, what are they called? They're like biscotti. biscotti. If you haven't tried those cookies, man, book a Delta flight, ASAPers, get on there, ask for extras. Tell them Sean sent you. Okay, so we've got a question from Ryan Martin. Ryan says, unfortunately, my uh, dog has mild, had a mild seizure this evening for the first time. Well, I do plan on getting this checked out by a vet. I do have a question for you about this. Do you think it's possible for an e-collar to trigger a seizure, like maybe if the dog has epilepsy? I'm pretty doubtful that the e-collar triggered this, and I'm doubtful that my dog has epilepsy, but I just want to be sure. Um, so, Ryan. No, uh, e-collars cannot trigger um, seizures, cannot trigger epilepsy, and uh, there's a lot of, if you go on the internet, there'll be a lot of um, information um, on certain forums, uh, typically on really on positive only forums where they will be debating this and they will be talking because their, their angle is they really want people to stop using e-collars. So, They'll, they talk a lot about that it, that it can cause that, that it will cause dogs to have seizures, that of course you're shocking a dog, and of course that's the natural fallout or outcome. But that's not the case. So if you do more research, you'll find that that isn't the case. Um, if your vet doesn't know um, and tries to tell you that that is the case, then he needs to do more research as well. So um, just for the record, e-collars cannot cause seizures, and uh, they don't cause any of that stuff so uh, but if you want to double check any of that stuff for yourself and do some research and make sure that you're well armed when you go in to talk to your vet then um, you can absolutely do that of course the more information you've got the, the more power and more knowledge you've got as a trainer because I know you're working on doing that so hope that helps um, okay so we're moving on to um, let's see Lindsay Ray Fontaine this is awesome Lindsay uh, was part of our, I think, I think we answered her uh, in Jackson Square, right? When yeah. we were uh, in NOLA, I think. So she says, I nearly shed a tear today as a gang of skateboarders scooted down the street and my dog didn't even care. I got my prong collar and have been taking it slow and limiting exposure to the things that my dog reacted to through your instructions and I think his mind is right. Laud, I thought I'd have this little man-hating skateboard eating machine forever. So no questions, just a thank you. Lindsay, that's our best question, even though it's not a question. That's the best stuff in the world. Um, we're so excited for you, and um, both of us. So excited. Yay. Um, so it just goes to show you that a little bit of elbow grease, a little bit of focus, a little bit of commitment um, can really turn some of these dogs around in a pretty quick fashion. Of course, there's some dogs that need more work and might need board and trains or ongoing trainer help and things like that. But there's a lot of dogs out there that are, and a lot of owners that are struggling with stuff that seem really, really bad and really, really problem, problem, problematic and really painful, but that can actually be helped fairly quickly with the right tools and the right approach. So you're a great example of that with what appeared to be a dog that was in a really, really bad state. Not appeared that it wasn't happening. Obviously it was happening, but I think appeared to be something more severe as far as help-wise. And then you've been able to go in, do some good hard work, use the right tools, use a good training approach, and get some really awesome results pretty quickly. So uh, we're really excited about that, and we see that all the time as well when people come to us that have been suffering for a long time, uh, get the right tools on, give them some good strategies, and see some really amazing stuff happen. So uh, we're really excited for you. Thanks for trusting us. Thanks for uh, following through and being an awesome owner and doing the work. Um, that can sometimes be uncomfortable work, especially if you've had a dog that's had trouble in public around people or skateboards and possibly are very likely vocalized and made a scene and can be very embarrassing. So a lot of people just kind of give up or won't, won't do the work. So I really applaud you, both of us applaud you for doing that hard work and going out there and making some magic happen with your dog. 
pretty cool stuff and inspiring for other people that post questions here or are just perusing my page and looking for help and they get to see that and see somebody that's making it happen even without a trainer on their own so really proud of you pretty awesome stuff very cool Lindsay okay and we're getting to the very end here this is the last question is Sarah Brandt um, which is a different Sarah than the first question sorry I'm trying to stretch my leg it's falling asleep okay Sarah Brandt says for Q&A Saturday what is the definition of a balanced dog a balanced pack I hear this term and I have a general sense of how it is being used but it would be helpful to be clear on both the definition and what it would look like in my dogs what is why is a balanced dog important what creates a balanced dog balanced pack thanks a lot of balanced questions in there um, that's a that's a good it's a really um, hands falling asleep and Laura's reaching for pretzels um, it's it's not only a really good question but it's a little bit of a challenging question I think um, I have to really kind of dig in a little bit to, to answer that so I'd say like people dogs come in a lot of different forms of balance um, the, the this this perception or idea that there's perfect dogs out there with no issues I, I, I think it's a real fallacy um, I've got some pretty great dogs that I own myself but all of them have their issues um, none of them are perfect um, are they balanced by my definition which I'll try and get into a little bit more deeply yes but they're not perfect so I'd, I'd like to first start off by saying that balanced dogs don't necessarily mean perfect dogs they don't necessarily mean they are dogs without quirks or issues or more training that can be done um, so that's just a good one to get out there because I think there's a lot of pressure a lot of TV show stuff has put pressure on people to have a balanced dog or a balanced pack and um, I think the, the, the perception of that is that those are dogs that are perfect, those are dogs without issues, those are dogs without quirks, and that is not the case. As somebody who knows a lot of very, very talented dog trainers, um, I see most of those people have dogs that have quirks. That I've never seen a perfect dog, even, even some famous TV show folks. So it's, it's a good thing to check in with, make sure you don't put too much pressure on yourself or your dogs. Now that said, um, balanced dogs, to me, are dogs that are able to be able to be calm when they need to be calm they know how to manage their energy they can lay down when you ask them to lay down or they can do it on their own without being anxious constantly without pacing constantly they're dogs that aren't struggling with separation anxiety when their owners leave um, they're dogs that are, are not reactive on leash when another dog goes by they're um, dogs that are obviously not dog aggressive um, that are, are that are not being proactive and aggressing towards dogs that aren't that when other dogs aren't offering any reason for that they're dogs that are not growling at human beings um, or being aggressive towards human beings when there's no cause when there's no need when a human hasn't abused them or done something to go to create um, uh, a pressure that would cause or, or necessitate that kind of reaction so I think balance is really just about dogs being uh, you know what's a balanced person you know it's, it's a juicy question um, we're all we're all a little I guess it's Laura Morgan we're lucky we've got one on this plane here to, to as, as our prototype to, to draw from so um, but you know I've got Junior I've got Manny I've got Belle Laura's got Hercules they're all I would say balanced dogs I can have them around any dog and we're safe I can have them around any person and they're safe they don't struggle when we leave um, they're able to lay down and be in one place and chill out and hang out um, but all of them have quirks all of them have stuff going on so I, I'd say that they're a good definition of balance um, but you know Belle has some obsessive stuff and she also has had some panicky stuff from some things that have transpired in the past um, Manny can get excited when he sees certain dogs on walks it's not reactivity but it's excitement um, is he perfect on a walk when when that happens no he's not perfect but I can have him run any dog and I know he's safe so um, so anyway so, so that's getting a little bit uh, you know kind of off off a ways but so I'm just trying to give kind of personal life descriptions of, of what I see as balance 
Um, why is balance important? Well, it's really important if you're going to be doing multiple dogs, if you're doing dog training, if you're doing fostering, if you're bringing dogs into your home and trying to help them get better um, because dogs learn so much like we are. We're so heavily influenced by each other. Um, a badly balanced or a non-balanced dog is going to have a negative impact on other dogs around him. So if you're trying to bring foster dogs in or rescue dogs or even pr professional dog training client dogs in and you don't have a balanced pack, those dogs are going to be picking up bad habits from un the unbalanced dog that you might already have or multiple dogs. So the trick is because we're also influenced by each other, humans and dogs, if we've got balanced dogs which are healthy, smart, you know, making smart choices dogs are making smart choices then they'll start rubbing off on the other dogs so a dog might come into your home and even without getting a ton of direction from you by being around dogs that are that are um, behaving appropriately around you know triggers or on walks or in the home around people they'll actually start to rub off on the other dog they'll start to impact that dog's choices and behavior now couple that with good information from you and of course things get really juicy and 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 the progress is is much more speedy but you can use those other dogs for to, for that dog to model off of then of course if the dog's got issues with dogs aggression wise you have to have a balanced pack in order to have one problem dog that you're focused on while you have a balanced pack that's not going to react negatively right so if you've got a dog that's dog aggressive from fear or whatever reason you need to be able to bring that dog around balanced dogs and know that the dogs that you're working with, your personal pack, aren't going to aggress or escalate if the other dog makes a bad choice. You have to know you've got one dog to worry about, not two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten dogs. So when I bring a, a dog aggressive dog out with me, I've done foundation work, of course, but when I bring them out around my dogs, I know that my dogs are going to be solid and that I really only have to focus on one dog. So what happens is, <laughs> A dog that's been dog nervous, dog aggressive, dog reactive, whatever, gets around my dogs and starts to build confidence and trust because he sees my dogs aren't pressuring him, my dogs aren't dangerous, my dogs aren't a hazard, my dogs aren't a risk to him. So what happens from that? Just like anything else, you become comfortable. When you see that you're safe, you become comfortable. So balanced dogs can help other dogs learn that they're safe, which starts to remove aggression and things like that. Now, if you've got a major dog aggression case, then you might have to inhibit that aggression with a correction coming from you to start off before he can even, you know, try and surmount um, being around other dogs. But we're talking, that's kind of like far afield. And that's pretty heavy duty stuff. But mainly, yeah, Laura's saying I gotta wrap up because I, I get rambly. So, balanced dogs. Hopefully, that covered what they are and what the value of them. Uh, you know, having balanced dogs is a huge asset for me in the work I do, um, helping other dogs regain their trust and uh, and being comfortable around other dogs themselves. And uh, and that's it. So that's Q and A Saturday, um, coming from a unique location. On uh, what are we on Delta? Little. I don't know. Um, cookies were had, pretzels were had, information was shared. Uh, sleepy and unshowered um, folks, both of us. Um, hopefully, you can you can um, hopefully you can give us a pass on that and know that we're we're just trying to give you our good stuff and time time is tight. So, uh, anyways, Q and A Saturday. We'll get this out to you guys as soon as possible. Thank you so much for asking your questions and following us and trusting us. We appreciate it so much, and we'll see you next time. And uh, Laura Morgan, tell them goodbye. Bye. See you guys. Bye.